This is Duke University. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming this evening to celebrate the release of the Visualizing Venice volume. My name is Kristen Huffman, and as a scholar of <coughs> early modern Venetian art with a keen interest in digital methods, it's been a special honor to have co-edited this, edited this volume with my colleagues Caroline Brazilius, renowned architectural historian and one of the two founders of Visualizing Venice, along with Andrea Giordano, an esteemed architect at the University of Padua and newly appointed director. In preparing for this evening, I recall my first official Visualizing Venice meeting in June of 2013, and the impression and inspiration elicited by the amazing work that my colleagues had already accomplished in just a few years. In many ways, hazy visions of how to tackle some of my own problems with my research came into clear focus in Padua on that warm afternoon. It was in this very meeting that a book was first proposed by Andrea Giordano in an effort to synthesize in a citable format all that had been accomplished. Visualizing Venice has arrived and other teams of scholars at other institutions were looking at the methodology and that had been established as a novel approach to the field of art, architectural, and urban history. Visualizing Venice sought to consider the life of a city in its constantly morphing and flexible nature. Specifically, we sought to show change over time through mapping and modeling, forging an approach that surpassed our traditional mode of showing static images. <clears throat> the idea was to create dynamic <coughs> visualizations that captured and communicated transformations over a period of approximately 500 years. With that in mind, this new methodology to art and architectural history carefully integrated classical approaches with digital methodologies. This systematic integration is apparent in all three phases of our process. First, the acquisition of data, for example, conducting archival research while simultaneously capturing digital, often invisible information with tools such as ground penetrating and geothermal radar and laser scanning. This is followed by the interpretation of acquired data which can be quote unquote built with interoperable databases, 3D models, and geographic information systems. And finally, the communication of our results, often with emerging technologies and other digitally driven and interactive features, including reconstructions, augmented, and virtual realities. But why Venice? What makes this city so special? And why was it chosen above others in consideration, such as Naples and Paris? I could supply a number of reasons, but there are two primary considerations worth noting here. First, Venice offered a unique and multifaceted case study due to the interrelationship between the built and natural environments. Its unique morphology informed the urban contours and remarkable features, ones that evolved as a means of living in a city in the middle of a marshy lagoon. And what should say not simply living, but thriving in what was one of the most powerful states on the international stage until Napoleon's entry into the city in 1797. And this leads me to the second reason, the amount of archival material still today accessible, both written and visual, which is quite phenomenal and allowed teams of experts to create between five and seven historical layers that effectively visualize this change over time. Since its founding, different teams have gone on to make recognizable contributions, extending our consideration of particular zones of the city to think about Venice and its lagoon islands holistically. But from the beginning, visualizing Venice sought to reach a wide and varied audience, from scholars in the field, to students, to an educated and interested general public. With that in mind, two particularly successful forms of public outreach have emerged with our scholarly work. The first are our pedagogical initiatives. These come in the form of classes taught here at Duke and Padua, as well as what have become highly sought after workshops coordinated by my colleagues, Victoria Zabo and Mark Olson. 
These workshops have their beginnings with institutional support from the Delmas Foundation, and in the past few years have grown in vision and prestige through the support of the Getty Foundation. In addition to training young scholars, we have become a point of reference and consultants for other teams of scholars, developing equally ambitious and innovative projects. In tandem with the pedagogical outreach is our scholarly agenda that seeks to communicate our research findings and visualizations. This has come in the form of conferences, symposia, and publications, in addition to three prominent exhibitions. On the screen here are visualizations and imagery from the latest exhibition of Portrait of Venice, which I have the privilege of curating. Due to our ability to create digital stories for interactive displays that hang alongside original works of art, the Correr Museum in Venice has asked us to develop a permanent installation, one that will breathe renewed energy into this museum, the city. The response to visualizing Venice has been phenomenal, and we are on the brink to expanding in new directions, changing ourselves over time from visualizing Venice to visualizing cities. So while Venice offered a complexity of challenges for how to think about the built and natural environment, we can now also think about the application of our methodology in new places, such as Padua, Athens, Krakow, and Durham, among others. Venice will soon be joined by other interesting sites and their own unique historical phenomena, perhaps folding in new methodological considerations and enabling broader comparative analyses. While ours has always been a collaborative initiative, we are catapulting ourselves forward into an even more expansive collaboration. In a largely collective sense, we are poised to learn from one another and enjoy exceptional intellectual exchanges. And we shall reap additional unidentified rewards for our constantly evolving questions. As Italo Calvino wrote in Invisible Cities, you take delight not in a city seven or 70 wonders, but in the answer it gives to a question of yours. And it is in this very spirit that we have come together to celebrate the book, our questions, our different efforts and varying experiences, <coughs> and what this all represents for the advancement of digital humanities. In addition to thanking my Italian colleagues who could not be here today, among them Donatella Calabi, I would like to point out quickly the contributors to the volume who are in the audience. Andrea Giordano, who is here, Cosimo Monteleone, Mark Olson, Victoria Zavo, <coughs> Anna Jacobs, right here, and of course, Caroline Brazilius, one of the two founders of Visualizing Venice, who will make a brief presentation this evening. We will always be grateful for her indefatigable energy and resourcefulness for getting our enterprise off the ground. Paul Jaskett, director of Wired and newly appointed co-director of Visualizing Venice, Visualizing Cities, will also make brief comments on pedagogy and public outreach. And Matthew uh, Booker will round out our presentation this evening, a history professor at North Carolina State, deeply steeped in digital <coughs> scholarship, and who happens to have participated in the first Visualizing Venice workshop. So without further, further ado, Caroline, but I've been holding up this podium because it fell. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, but. <laughs> Analog technology. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, that's a little bit of excitement. I'm going to talk about dynamic process. This doesn't inspire confidence. Yeah. Let's make sure the mic is Visualizing Venice began in 2009, and it began with a phone call. And the most improbable, <laughs> most improbable beginning. Um, it began with a phone call from the uh, then director of the Delmas Foundation, uh, with whom uh, I have been working, at, uh, along with Donatella Calabi, for 
six years or seven years, uh, running graduate workshops. And I got the kind of phone call that I wish I got all the time, which was George saying to me, listen, we have 25,000 extra dollars. Do you have a project? I said, yes. I said, yes, of course, tomorrow I'll send you a proposal. But I had no idea whatsoever what this project would be. And I went to bed thinking optimistically, well, you know, something will emerge. And of course, at four in the morning, it did. I, I thought, well, we've been, we've been experimenting along with uh, Mark and several other colleagues uh, with digital technologies. We taught this amazing course uh, in the spring of 2009 about mo modeling uh, and using historical materials. And uh, it suddenly seemed very clear to me that what we should do is switch these annual seminars that Donatella and I were doing and experiment with applying technology to research that was based on archival questions. So take the documents uh, from the many different kinds of remarkable archives in Venice, uh, apply them to specific research questions, and see what would happen if we began to model and map what the documents were telling us. So a direct link between research uh, and representation. So of course, I called up Donatella. And here's a photograph of me and Donatella. And there's this dude in the middle <laughs> <laughs> who's actually very nice and wrote a great book on concrete, but we're not going to talk about it. Um, uh, I called up Donatella uh, at 4 in the morning. I said, listen, Donatella. We have this opportunity. Let's just try a one-off experiment. Let's, you know, it wasn't anything about a long-term project. It had nothing to do with the book. But right? let's just see what would happen if we can train some graduate students in digital visualization technologies, apply those to certain research questions, collaborate, and see what happens. And she said yes. And so we planned this experiment to only be in 2010. Uh, but it has gone on, and it has gone on with the original founding principles that I uh, uh, suggested to Domitella, which was visualizing urban growth and change based on archival research, train students in digital technologies, develop collaborative projects and share expertise, and engage scholars in public history. That is, the capacity for these technologies to narrate stories about place and space seemed really very fundamental to me and critical in this time when the humanities are so much at risk, as people say, uh, all the time, and as is true. Uh, training students seemed integral to me, and especially now, it seems quite obvious. A lot of people are doing digital work, and it's great. But back in 2009, especially in Italy, this was not really considered very seriously. And we still have problems, of course, getting digital work accepted as scholarly work when it comes to criteria for promotion and tenure and so on. But why was that important? Because when we use these technologies, we think in a different way. We, in collaboration, we learn from our colleagues. But testing technologies out by modeling and mapping, we see new things. We ask completely new questions. It is an exponential leap forward in scholarship because it reframes what the questions can be in terms of process, right? in terms of dynamic relationships between buildings, in terms of growth and change. I mean, the ability of an animation, as you just saw in Kristen's wonderful um, animations, uh, how we can ask and answer questions, and that seems really important. And then show people, right? item number four, how important it is to sort of tell stories, interesting stories, to the engaged and curious public. So a year or so later, we started up a lab, and uh, that has been wonderfully uh, taught by um, Olson, Victoria Zabo, Hannah Jacobs, Ed Triplett. We have a whole team of people who go over and teach. I think you see Hannah's. <laughs> and what's really fun is that this lab, which is a Venice International University, with which Duke has a long standing, of course, is a long standing and indeed founding member, uh, we uh, have uh, these uh, Macs. Right? Uh, people put their names up, but they can also put uh, up signals that say help. <laughs> get me out of this mess, right? So that is a, a, a wonderful 
intense thing that was originally funded by the Getty, um, I mean by the Delmas, but now has continued on uh, very splendidly with um, Getty funding. So, what's important about that is that we use the city as a document, right? We use buildings as documents, we use the history of the city as a document, and in this particular case, we have a Napoleonic pedaster, and in darker pink, you can see the four areas on which our group has focused its efforts so far when it comes just uh, to Venice. And those collaborations are important because we learn from each other. I can speak as an um, older scholar that traditionally humanists have worked by themselves. Right, by themselves, and we have been solitary um, souls in, in ambitious projects. The idea that we learn from each other, that we collaborate, and that these are team projects rather than individual enterprises is so deeply important, I think, and transforming uh, the way we work. So I'm just going to say that, of course, one of our main themes is modeling growth and change. I'll just show quickly one part of Venice, which is Great Dominican Church, San Zanipolo, San Giovanni e Paolo, which is now the whole hospital complex. God forbid you should ever have to go there in any way. But what's interesting to us, of course, is the way in which we can understand that when you need to expand, when you think of history as institutions making space for themselves, in Venice that meant making land out of water, of course. Uh, and you can look at this very crude diagram of mine. I chose that the Dominicans and their church and their cloisters here, right, already probably had to do some sub substantial landfill, and that that was exponentially increased in the early modern period. I think my animations are not working. No? Can you hear about so we're not going to worry about them. <laughs> we're just going to proceed ahead. But the, uh, the uh, area of San Giovanni de Paolo is uh, right up uh, here. Mm -hmm. And the idea from the start was to take individual parts of the city and uh, explore them and expand them. Mm -hmm. And so, but I can end, however, with a glorious animation that is made by our collaborators from Padua, uh, which is on the complex of Santa Maria de la Carita, which is one of these areas that has been uh, delimited, <laughs> delimited by uh, canals and which has been radically transformed over time. And we begin with the Jacobo de Barbari uh, map. This is now exhibited in the Museum of the Academia <laughs> in the restoration of the building. And it actually uh, points the audience to a cloister by Palladio, which is not hitherto been uh, visible. So I'll just let that run for one second. About the book, when my colleagues proposed that we needed a book, I said, no, we don't need a book. I mean, after all, we're in digital, right? I mean, why do we need something that's in print? Uh, but the fact was, it was a great idea. And I, I take it all back and mean the opposite. Because <laughs> the book actually forced us to pull our ideas together and actually come to grips with all the different aspects of this project. Several important exhibitions, two uh, at the Palazzo Ducale, uh, one at Duke, other smaller exhibitions, the Teaching and Training Initiative, which has profoundly to do with undergraduates as well as workshops for graduate students, uh, research papers, uh, and online uh, 3D models and so on. So, uh, the book was really a kind of nice recognition that this project, which was only going to last one year, 2010, has in fact continued to thrive and flourish uh, with the wonderful collaboration of my many colleagues, some of whom I'm happy to see here. So, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to be brief, but uh, that's a wonderful segue, Caroline, because I'm going to talk about the book. Um, uh, it's really uh, quite a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, my thanks, of course, to Kristen, uh, but also the, the editors, Andrea, Caroline, and Kristen, for this wonderful project. And it's, of course, so many of our contrib contributors are also in the audience, so that's really uh, quite wonderful for me. 
Um, I think it really it, it shows uh, how many of our core members of the Wired Lab for Digital Art History and Visual Culture uh, are really trying to collaborate on bigger projects. So I'm very proud of that and proud to be here representing that. Um, but I think that what the, the thing I'd like to kind of really focus on briefly is um, the three components that I see coming out of this book, uh, which overlap somewhat with what Kristen and Caroline have said, uh, but that is uh, certainly the new intellectual work that this book represents, um, the new ways of reaching students, and the new kinds of public outreach. Uh, and I think those three things are really uh, the core of the project. I think this is not only exciting for me because it fulfills the mission of WIRED, which is to connect uh, cutting edge faculty research with also student development and student contributions to that research. But for me, more importantly even than that, is the way that it sets a new bar for digital art history in the field as a whole. So that kind of broader expanse, I think is very, very important. So I'll start first with the, the pedagogic impact. We've seen a little bit of that, but I, I think it's worth kind of talking a little bit more specifically about uh, what this book has to offer. Uh, it's not only in that sense about reaching and engaging students, uh, but the chapters really uh, address this kind of wider project of what that really can mean as an intellectual work. Uh, so Caroline's argument, for example, of teaching, training, and imagining a new kind of urban and architectural history, uh, I think is really a model that we can really try to internalize. Uh, from that all the way to the end of the book, Hannah's uh, appendix, which shows how 3D modeling techniques uh, really help to understand a very specific site, Santa Margarita, uh, the portal of Santa Margarita. And in that sense, also, the, the, the pedagogic initiatives of art history are also connected to uh, the technological uh, engagement that the students have to uh, engage with as well. Uh, so I think Andrea and Mark's chapter, for example, uh, where they talk specifically in this regard, quote, understanding the nature of the technical affordances has been essential in every part of our enterprise, recognizing that technologies both enable and constrain. They shape not only the insights that can be generated by historical research, but also the research questions themselves. In concrete ways, technologies inform and possibly determine research trajectories. That's a pedagogic initiative, and it's a pedagogic initiative that is not the stereotype of digital humanities where we naively accept the technical tool at our disposal, but rather sees the technological as a fundamental part of the pedagogic itself. This, of course, has one of its also important goals in terms of the public outreach, the second point I'd like to briefly address. I think most succinctly put in Caroline's conclusion, where she says, quote, our success is embedded in our conviction that stories about place and space are compelling, and that dynamic visualizations through the use of animation can elucidate complex discussions about urban change that are otherwise inaccessible to the public. Inaccessibility, I think that's the word, right? It, this is about making high-end, rigorous art historical research somehow also communicate much beyond its more limited academic circles. Not that there's anything wrong with that academic focus, but the fact that we can reach both of those through this kind of modeling and through this particular approach, I think is fundamental to understanding the public component of this intellectual work. In that sense, I do think it's best exemplified by uh, Kristen's uh, curation of the Visualize Events project, the, the great Jacobo de Barbary map, which I must say I did not know until I was immersed in Duke's culture. And now I'm quite familiar with, Duke with it, and it really was a great pleasure to have to live, to live with that project uh, at the National Museum last semester. Um, I think it also showed how convincingly, how convincingly that bringing uh, this kind of visualization really involves the public in close looking. Uh, that is something that Kristen and Andrea, their contribution also emphasizes. Uh, when they're talking about this exhibition, they say, quote, a highlight and important outcome of the exhibition is that visitors can look at a significant historical document in an unprecedented way. A deep dive visual analysis made possible through the digital tools and their creative application, end quote. That seems to be important because it really emphasizes two aspects of what's going on here. One is that it makes one of the most difficult but also fundamental art historical techniques, close looking, absolutely part of what the public also has to experience. And we saw that in spades with the exhibition in the fall. But it's not merely close looking, it's close looking within the kind of rich archival environment that surrounds the close looking. So it asks those historical questions, it poses those historical questions, but it relies on that digital visualization in order to make the link between the object and that very deep historical context. 
that's a public task that I think we can really perform here, and that was performed and is modeled uh, very much in the pedagogic sections of this book. But I did want to finally end uh, on the intellectual work which I think is involved. Uh, after all, we're at a research university, we should be talking about those important contributions as well. And I think it's also what's really important is the way that that, that research component is, again, woven throughout the volume. Now, this is somehow highlighted in case studies, so we actually learn about specific sites uh, in Venice in very deep detail. So a case study on a civic hospital, a school, church, and monastery, a motion in the lagoon, a really interesting chapter about how motion in the lagoon says something to us, botanical gardens in the cathedral. So these really important urban sites and how we can analyze them more in depth. Uh, it also indicates how we need to, these, these research divisions also indicate how we need to collaborate because every one of them, some of them single authored, some of them double authored, triple authored, each one of those chapters though is really very much reliant on an infrastructure of people and methods and an imbrication with other parts of the project so much so that it really also shows how a new kind of art historical scholarship has to also be fundamentally collaborative. Uh, I also think that there are really important new findings, and um, uh, the editors will forgive me, I did actually go through and pick out all the sections with the ghetto, because I, <laughs> I work in the Nazi period, and so I was fascinated by how much we learn about the, the Jewish ghetto, uh, particularly in Alessandro Ferrighi's chapter, that highlights the, the surprising and profound physical changes to the ghetto, and also their historical import after the Napoleon tore down the walls in 1797. So these are the kinds of historical questions and the kind of rigorous questions that address absolutely central questions in our history and a broader field of urban studies uh, that I think the volume really raises. But, but that's not all, right? The, the, the kind of rigorous scholarly import is also about the fact that the volume itself emphasizes not just involving our undergraduates, but involving scholars in the training process itself. So here I have to point to Victoria's really important uh, chapters, uh, one on the way that the summer institutes were structured to introduce scholars and train scholars in these kinds of methods in order to pursue scholarly and computational work. So it's really both at the same time. Um, also, she combines that in, in her chapter, I think, uh, on how or why we would use a mobile application to reimagine, again, the ghetto, I'm afraid, uh, but to reimagine the ghetto in terms of a scholarly and a pedagogic question. In that sense, it's really also the scholarly outreach that she brings back to also, once again, the public focus. This is a long way of saying that what I find fascinating about reading this volume is that you can't really separate the threads that I've just tried to separate. That is, that the pedagogic mission is always there, either in the background or in the foreground. Uh, the public outreach is always there in the background or the foreground. And the scholarly project is woven throughout. The inseparability of these three, I think, really is very, very important. Because in some senses, the interconnectedness of questions that place, the, the interconnectedness of questions that place a demand on other art historians, not only those studying Venice, to engage with the digital model. At the same time, it shows how art historical questions and art historical methods help to expand the capacity for analysis in the computational realm. And finally, it's about tying both of these together and seeing how they can engage wider students and a wider public in a more critical in, in, uh, investigation of urban spaces. Certainly, I think this is a worthy goal, one well represented and achieved by the contributors in this volume, and I say congratulations. <laughs>
as seen as, according to Dr. Bronner, a seen rabbinical tradition that he's invoking. And the great line on all the Dr. Bronner's labels, even since the 1970s, is all one. In fact, it's, an, it's a shouting thing. We're all one or none. All one, all one, all one. And so I thought of that, actually, when I read Caroline's wonderful overview. Here's my favorite line. Visualizing Venice isn't just a digital humanities project and visualization project. It's a commitment to teaching and training. So um, I teach in a program, a history program at NC State, which is dominated by public history. Many of our graduate students in particular, they go on to, to, to uh, design exhibits, to work in museums and in archives, they collaborate with the UNC School of Information Sciences. They think about uh, a shared authority, a voice for the public in the work that they do. My own work is in urban history and in environmental history. And I've written about San Francisco, another great urban estuary, another great water city. In fact, like half a dozen other New World cities, San Francisco has been called, or wants to be called, the Venice of the New World. Um, and uh, yes, indeed, so many cities would love that, that title. But, um, and, I'm, and I'm trying to map what people ate and how those foods moved into and out of the city and, and how the waters of the city mattered into the city's future as well as its past. So I had so many things to say about collaboration, about, I actually had exactly the same quote. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Andrea. Um, and so I've been scooped, but I think I'm going to say a couple of things anyway about method. And before I get to that, though, I want to comment about collaboration, a point Carolyn made. So, <coughs> you know, the classic image of the humanities is that the lone humanities scholar retreats to her hermitage. She grows her hair. She emerges with a tome held over her head, and she says, I did it. And then, and then we put it in the library. <laughs> and then that knowledge is there for always. At least that's it in history. Perhaps it's different in your own version of humanities. Um, but in fact, as we all know, there's no hermit. And while there is the National Humanities Center, there's a climate, there are a few hermitages as well. And it's community that is essential to all scholarly practice. That's something that digital humanities takes seriously. And maybe I think it's one of the great gifts of the digital humanities to the humanities as a whole, is that commitment to working with other people. And that's what I, I love about this book, because it's clear from Caroline's preview and her overview and from each of the chapters that everyone needs everyone else, has been pushed to do more things, to ask new questions. In the digital humanities, community isn't just something we appreciate, it's something we absolutely need. Because with collaboration, we get better questions. We get a broader audience. And I think, frankly, we have more fun. It's more fun to be challenged to learn something when we do that work. So there are so many things, so many themes that emerge in this book. The teaching and digital humanities component that, is so, that you spoke about so beautifully, actually, just now. Um, the question of shared authority in digital humanities research, this question of reaching this audience of people, not that audience. <laughs> um, the question of climate change and urban history, which is one I would love to see pursue in the future of this project, because there are so many Venices in this world, cities dependent on water, whether they be Rio or San Francisco. Um, the question of rapidly changing technologies that evolve as you're using them, a classic problem that you acknowledged in this book. Um, the problem of the shared database. Which one should it be? How do we update this thing? And the joys and difficulties of collaboration. But the question that Christian asked me was, could I think about methodologies? And so I'm going to stick to just one example from Andrea and Mark's chapter. I'm not going to read the great quote because I've been scooped. <laughs> but before I say that, I think when we talk about digital humanities, it's important to remember what we mean by digital and also what we mean by humanities. The great dream of many of us in the historical humanities is to inhabit the bodies and minds of those who have come before us so we can broaden our understanding of our own time, our own place, and our own lives. The past, as the saying goes, is a foreign country, and that makes it worth visiting, a place to learn from, a place to be inspired by. 
In music and in art and written documents and in architecture, we can visit those paths. So much of what we do and what we try to show our students how to do is to see others' lives more clearly. And this is fundamentally an emotional and philosophical goal. I'll just say it this way. It's a moral goal. It's a project that I think many of us regard as a sacred one. It's also a pragmatic and technical problem for us. It's hard enough to understand my lover's words and gestures, or for her to understand mine, let alone the tiny fragments of material that survive from lives lived centuries ago. And for that, we need technologies. We need means to understand more clearly, to interact with those fragments left behind. And that's where I was going to read the lovely quote already read about technologies both constraining as well as enabling. They do both. They can shape a trajectory for us in ways perhaps we didn't intend. They can close doors if we're not careful. And so the thought, the concern that went into choosing technologies here and in revisiting those tools is something I really admire about this book. And the fact that you, you talk about it, you admit it, you discuss it. So visualizing Venice enriches our understanding of that fragmented past by reconstructing the city's history in ways like in tool, using tools like GIS, 3D scanning. Some of this work is so very clever. Using paintings made with camera obscura to reverse, to create a reverse perspective. I love that. That's marvelous. Historical building information modeling that rejects the false certainty of photorealistic models. A great temptation for so many of us. And instead attempts to show alternative hypotheses. This is some of the most important and most difficult work we do in the digital humanities. Modeling buildings using a kind of virtual clay to not only acknowledge but invite other possible explanations, that's, that's, that's worthy, that's important, that's inspiring. These methods are very important because they open the work to others rather than closing the door, rather than saying, here is the finished knowledge. Know this, here it is. Instead, it says, what would you like to do with this? How would you tell this story? That matters a lot to me as a humanist and as someone who cares about digital humanities. But the thing I was happiest to see in Mark and Andrea's chapter was their discussion of the work of translation and persuasion. It's a lovely line. Here it is. Translation not only means conveying complex ideas in a clear manner, it also means building the literacies necessary for the broader public to be able to understand the scholarship. And this goes back to Caroline's point, this original concern. All one, teaching, research, and dissemination, and sharing. So meeting the public where they are, rather than insisting that they know what we know. Using gaming models, using gamification or games as an idea, this is important. Because it says, this is not only our information, our jargon, our knowledge. So the triple goal that runs through all of this work, research, teaching, reaching the public, I commend you for that and for the beauty of the book you've written. So what I want to know is what's next. <laughs> what I want to know is what's next. And I hope you push even harder on the public history aspect of this work. Go into those mobile apps you talked about. And I hope you'll talk about the things we might learn from our clever ancestors as they too grappled with rising seas, with rapid environmental and ecological change. I would love to see that. Thank you for having me for this event. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And I'd like to point out a couple more people. There are two people right here who were part of the original group, um, Alexandra Dawson and Erica Sherman, um, as well as, where's Mirka? hiding back there. A lot of the 3D models you saw that came from the exhibition she worked on. So again, it's this collaboration with the colleagues with varying expertise. Um, and she was side by side with us by Skype on phone almost every day to create and realize these beautiful um, images that you saw. So thank you, everybody, for coming. There's more drinks out and cheese we can chat and continue to celebrate a little bit longer. So thank you. Thank you.